Well, let's get into the Word today. First Peter is where we are, and we're going to pick up in verse number 13. So look at First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And I want you to notice that when you get to verse 13, how the verse begins, there's a word, therefore. So anytime you're reading the Bible and you come up to that word, therefore, there's always a shift that is happening. Something new is about to begin. So you look at it in its context. We look back to the first 12 verses that we've been looking at in 1 Peter, and they've all been, all been about how awesome salvation is. Well, now Peter is going to talk to us about how to live out our salvation. He's going to get very direct And he's going to talk about our behavior. So if you're a saved person today, your behavior should be different from people that are unsaved. And and Peter actually is going to call us to holiness. So that's our message today, a call to holiness. So let's read verse 13 to verse 17. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded... Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So when you were in uh, grade school, maybe you still are, middle school, did you ever have a nickname that people gave you? It may not even be polite to even say in church, so be careful. But when I was in eighth grade, I received a nickname. The summer before I went into eighth grade, I went to a student camp. I was already born again. I was already saved. But in that student camp, God really did a work in my life. The Lord that week at student camp put a call on my life to be a preacher. Now, I know it stuck because I was 13 when God called me out to be a preacher, and I'll be 54 this summer. So I've been faithful to this call that God has put on my life. But when I was younger, I lacked balance, lacked a lot of maturity, And when I went into eighth grade, man, I went in there as an evangelist to that public school that I went to. I wanted everyone to know that I was not ashamed of Jesus. So I wore a tie to school every day. Now that is a serious chick magnet going on, right? And I found the biggest black Bible at our house with the words on it, Holy Bible. And I carried it to school with me every day in eighth grade. I would leave gospel literature in the boys' bathroom. So while boys were writing dirty words on the wall, I was putting the Word of God everywhere. And so they began to call me a name. They gave me a nickname, Holy Boy. Now, at first, I didn't like it because I thought, well, they're just making fun of me. They're mocking me. But as I look back, I lacked a lot of maturity. I think I had the right motivation, just wasn't mature. The boldness was good. I just needed some balance. But everybody knew that Jeff Crook was not ashamed of Jesus Christ. What do people think of when they hear the word holy or holiness? If you were to go to Starbucks tomorrow and just speak to five, maybe seven people and ask them, What comes to your mind when you hear the word holy or holiness? You probably would get lots of different responses. If you're speaking to someone out of Catholicism, they might think about the Pope who is referred to as your holiness. 
Some people might think of architecture like a religious cathedral with uh, candles lit everywhere and a choir and robe singing, ooh, maybe that comes to their mind. Some people might think of a wild church and they say that church down the road, they're a bunch of holy rollers. Uh, so, some people might think about the grumpiest, meanest Christian they know because when someone's holy, they never smile, they're sour, they are lacking imagination, and they're like a victim to religion. Well, all of those answers for holiness are not accurate. That's why I'm really thrilled to teach you from an open Bible today about being holy and about what holiness looks like among Christians. You know, the Bible says we're to worship God in the beauty of his holiness. We just learned a new song that Pastor Spencer taught us about God is holy. So holy is good, it's not bad. I like to read this man named C.S. Lewis, and he called holiness the great myth. Many people have holiness bad. They don't understand it. Let me give you a quote from C.S. Lewis. How little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it's irresistible. When you really meet a person who's holy, they are very attractive. You want to be around holy people. If a man is looking for a wife, he wants to find a holy woman. Because if he finds a holy or godly woman, she will be virtuous, she will be tender, compassionate, loving, sympathetic, honest. He'll do anything to marry that holy woman. Every girl wants a good guy. All you single girls in the room, don't you settle, sister. You pray for a holy man. And when you get a holy man, you can trust him. When he's on a business trip, he won't take off his wedding band. When he's all alone, he won't look at nudie pictures on his mobile phone or on the internet. He's a holy man that you can depend on. You can trust. I'm telling you, holiness is marvelous. If you ever get a holy friend, a friend that you can count on, that will tell you the truth, that will accept you, that will love you if you have money or if you don't, those are the 2 a.m. friends we need to talk about. You never want to let go of a holy friendship. If you work for a holy boss, they'll treat you fair. They'll give you the respect and you'll give them respect. If you had a friend that died or a family member that died and they were holy, you can't get a seat in the funeral chapel because everybody shows up for the service of that holy person that touched our lives. So I want to tell you today that holiness is not frowning, sour, mean. Holiness is beautiful. Holiness is marvelous. And if you're a Christian today, that's exactly what God has called you to be. So if you have salvation, how are you to live out that salvation in a holy way? Now, Peter begins with a command in verse 13. So let's look at the command. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of God that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's the command that Peter gives. Will you write it down? Prepare your minds. It's right there out of the Bible. Preparing your minds for action. So if you're going to be a holy teenager, these awesome students today that were baptized, why do you get baptized? To get into the water? No. You get baptized because you've been born again. When you get saved, you get baptized. 
So these teenagers now are to have a holy walk. How can they do that when they go to a school that's maybe filled with a lot of temptations, bad influences? Listen, are you listening? It all starts with the mind. You got to get your mind right. You got to get your mind clear and focused. Now, when I grew up, I didn't read this verse, prepare your mind to action. I read it this way from a new King James Bible. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, somebody right now has a Bible like that. And it says, gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? How do you gird up? That sounds kind of weird. Gird up the loins of your mind. Well, in Bible days, it was an uh, idiom that most people all knew. Let me explain. So men in Bible days would wear tunics or robes. So when a man needed to move fast, run, get to work, he would gird up his tunic. He would gird up his robe between his legs, tie up the cloth in his loin belt so he could get some speed. So the word picture is you don't want anything to trip you up. Like someone would pull up the excess cloth, put it under their belt so they could take off. God wants us holy, and there's a lot of things that will trip us up. So we got to get our mind focused. We got to travel light. When God saved you, he didn't save you to sit. He saved you to run, to work, to witness, to serve, to share, to be a blessing. So we got to get our mind focused. What does a focused mind look like? Verse 13 again, it is sober-minded. See it? Now, when we see that word sober, we have a word association that comes to our mind, drunk. So people who aren't sober, they're drunk. And to be drunk means to be stupid. It means you do dumb things. It means you hurt people. You do hurtful things to yourself, to others. It means you're out of your mind. You're out of reality. Now, Peter's not talking about alcohol here. He's talking about spiritual, mental acuteness. Being clear and thinking right. We need to think right. We need to be focused. What do we focus on? Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the way we live holy is we got to look ahead. We got to realize that something awaits every Christian, the return of Jesus Christ. When you hear about the Iran invading uh, Israel with these missiles, we hear that. We should pray. We did. We should continue to pray. But you know, also that should let us know that God is up to something. That we were never intended to live on this earth forever. We can't. We know that we are going somewhere. We're moving into eternity. And when we hear news like this, it should cause us as believers not to panic. Corey Ten Boone said, there's no panic in heaven, just plans, just plans. And God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for all of us. And we're to be looking forward to the return of Jesus. Just like a kid is looking forward to summer break. Just like a senior is looking forward to graduation. Just like a bride is looking forward to her wedding. Christians are to look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And you won't do that if your mind's not focused. If your mind's not focused and you're not clear, sober-minded, you're not fixing your hope on the future, you'll get distracted and get in trouble. When the Olympics were in Athens, Greece, 2004, there was a man that got in trouble because he got distracted in his mind. His name was Matt Inmans, and he was so close to winning the gold medal. The contestant that he was in, the contest he was in rather, was the men's three position 50 meter rifle competition. Now, 
Matt Inmans had, had done so well, he was number one. All he had to do was get just in the vicinity of the bullseye, he'd get the goal. He didn't even have to hit the bullseye. If he just got remotely close, no one was even close to him. He could take home the goal. But something happened. He is in lane three, shooting at target three, and something happened that has never happened in the Olympics. He got distracted in his mind and shot at the target in lane two. They said, what are you doing? He said, I don't know. I just got distracted. He was number one. He then became number eight, all because he got distracted. And I'm looking at many of you today. You, you're Christian. You're born again. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But right now, you're distracted. Something's distracting you. It might be something you're chasing. It might be something that you're meddling in that is not building you up in Christ. So whatever is distracting you today, listen. Listen to the pastor today. Get your mind focused on Jesus. Be sober-minded. Fix your hope on the return of Jesus. Peter then writes in verse 14, as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. I underscored that for a reason. Because I've got some former ignorance in my life. Do you? I've done some things that I'm ashamed of. We all have a past. We all have things we never want to get out public. And here's what Peter is saying about our former past. Don't go back to it. Write that down. Don't go back. Don't go back to the way you lived. When Jesus Christ saved you, he saved you out of that lifestyle. Don't go back. Now, he calls us obedient children. We're to obey our Father in heaven. We are not to go back into the passions of our former lifestyle. Why does he talk about children? Probably because some of us get childish. You say that's good to be childish. No, to be childlike is good. To be childish is to be bratty. And sometimes children can be real childish about eating. You will present good food to them that will build their body. The pediatrician said they need all the colors on the plate, right? But they don't want the colors on the plate. They don't want the good food. They want candy. Candy lies to you. Candy tells you that sugar boost makes you feel good, but not for long. And a lot of us like children that do not have a good diet on holy things. We begin to have an appetite for things that leave us empty, that give us hangovers that hurt us spiritually. That's why Peter is saying, don't go back to that lifestyle. We all have a BC before Christ, all of us. You're like, man, before Christ, you know, I wasn't a Christian, but man, I had the time of my life. Did you really? Did you really? Those fake friends you had, that emptiness that you had, you're running to this thing, to that thing, to do it for you, and you always stayed empty. Peter is saying, don't go back to that lifestyle. Jesus saved you out of that. Don't sell your soul to this world. That's so tragic when you see people selling their soul to this world when you cannot have the world. It will slip through your fingers. Last year, we studied a book called Corinthians. There's a verse in Corinthians that reads like this. Those who use the things of the world, but not engrossed in them, for the world is passing away. We've got to use the world, but don't be engrossed in the world. Don't sell your soul for your work. Don't sell your soul for your college education. Don't sell your soul for likes on Instagram. 
Don't sell your soul for a world that will just drag you to hell. You were made for eternity, not for this world. Jesus wants your soul. And Peter said, don't go back to the worldly way of living. Let that go. Learn to use a word that every Christian needs to use more frequently. Let me teach you something. I want to tell you, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you need to use this word more often. You ready? No. You need to say no to your flesh. You need to say no to unholy things. You're like, if you say no all the time, you'll be a negative person. If you say no, it will keep you from a negative lifestyle. Learn to say no to those things that pull you away from God. Learn to say no to that temptation, that, that bad friendship, that all it's doing is moving you away from Jesus and messing with your mind. So look what Peter does. He gives us a command, prepare your mind. He then tells us to not go back to the way we used to live. Okay, then how do I live? Well, he now says, live godly. Write that down. Live godly. Now, here's what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for verse 15 and 16. Because this is the thrust of the message about holiness. Read it with me. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you should be holy for I am holy. So here we're taught right on the pages of scripture that if we're believers, we're to be holy people. Why? Because our creator is holy. Our God is holy. Spencer, a moment ago when he introduced the new song, he read from the Bible. He read Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the earth is full of his glory. If you were to go to the book of Revelation, you would read something like this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Have you ever noticed in Scripture, God is called holy three times? Holy, holy, holy. You know what I've never seen in the Bible? That God is love, love, love. Or God is just, just, just. Or God is merciful, merciful, merciful. Now he is. He is just. He is love. He is merciful. He is all that. But his primary attribute, his number one characteristic, he is a holy God. What does that mean? It has a negative and it has a positive. The negative is he has nothing to do with sin. He has nothing to do with evil. He is all pure. So he is totally separated from defilement, from evil, from sin. That's the negative. What's the positive? He is perfect, pure, truthful. And this is the holy God that saves us from our evil. That redeems us from our sin. This is the holy God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And when Jesus took all of our unholiness, it was a holy God that turned away while the son absorbed all the wrath. And the son said, my God, why are you forsaking me in this moment? Because Jesus Christ took all the guilt, the unholiness, the punishment, so we could be holy. So if God is holy, guess what we're to be? We're to be holy. Let me give you some synonyms for holy to help you. Godly. Here's another one. Christ-like. Let me get personal. You're to be a godly man. If you're married, you're to be a godly husband. If you're a father, you're to be a godly dad. You're to be a godly woman. If you're married, you're to be a godly wife. If you have children, you're to be a godly mama. If you're in middle school, you're to be godly on the middle school campus you attend. You're to be godly in the workplace. 
You're to be godly neighbors to those that are around you. That's what God is saying. Because I am holy, I want you to be godly, holy, Christ-like. Notice Peter says there's nothing off limits about this holiness. He said, be holy in all your conduct. Oh, I wonder what that means. It means what it says, and it says what it means. Philip's translation says, in every department of your life. The men are studying Titus. If you're a man, come join us Wednesdays at 6. We're in the book of Titus. I got to teach the lesson last Wednesday. We got another great lesson this week. And in Titus, Paul would write about living godly. Listen to this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That's good news. It teaches us to say, no, there's our word, to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I want you to look at something. I want you to put your eyeballs on verse 16 for me. So when Peter is writing about holiness, he says, since it is written. Pause there for a moment. He said, be holy because this is written. Written where? Old Testament. Which book? You ready? Your favorite book? Leviticus. That's where you had your quiet time this morning before you came to church, right? It's funny to me that in January, people will have a New Year's resolution. I'm going to read the whole Bible this year. That's awesome. Until they get to Leviticus. I remember a brand new believer when I used to pastor in Florida. He read the Bible through and he said, Pastor Jeff, you got to help me. I'm in this book called Leviticus and I don't understand anything it says. I understand him. Leviticus, it's, it's strange. You read Leviticus and it talks about your diet. It talks about your clothing and it talks about a lot of stuff. And you're like, man, do we even need that? Leviticus book yes do we even need to pay attention to that Leviticus book yes let me give you a little history lesson so in Genesis sovereign God selected chose a man named Abraham and he said you're now my people in the book of Exodus God's chosen people were in slavery in Egypt And God redeemed them out of Egypt. They left Egypt not with swords and clubs and spears. Do you know how they exited in Exodus? Do you know how they left Egypt, God's people? By the blood of a lamb. By the shed blood of a lamb. God said, kill a lamb, take the red lamb's blood, painted on the doorpost. It's a crude picture of the cross if you think about it. And they left Egypt by the blood of the lamb. Leviticus. So God's chosen people who he redeemed out of bondage are now traveling in the great and terrible wilderness. And God begins to give them laws of fellowship. God begins to tell them how to treat one another and how to respond to him. And he tells them in this book, he tells his chosen, redeemed people, I want you to be holy. Let me tell you something blew me away. So when I got ready to teach you the Bible this week, I've been cruising through Leviticus. Woo, it's a book, right? You know what I've noticed? God said, I'm holy, you be holy. You know how many times he said that in Leviticus? 50 times. Wow. 50 times. Over and over again, God said, I'm holy and I want you to be holy. Why was God so big on holiness? A little bit more history. So in Bible days, there were all types of nations around Israel. They worshiped false gods. They had their gods that they would worship. Gods like Chemish and Remnon and Moloch, and the list goes on. They would build monuments to these gods. They would fashion idols out of wood and stone and gold. And they would say, 
There is Rimnon. There is Chemish. There is Malik. Bow and worship. But God's people never built idols. Matter of fact, God said to build an idol of me is an abomination. And in the Decalogue called the Ten Commandments, he said no idols. Why? Because you can't fashion God in an image. He is infinite, holy God. And no idol will ever do for the greatness of our God. No idols. Well, how will the people know you're our God? I mean, they build an idol and say, there's our God. There's our God. How will they know who our God is? God said, they'll know your God through the impress of him on you. You are so holy, distinct, and different. You love people. You tell the truth. You're faithful to your spouse. You do justice. You do mercy. You're honest. You are so distinct. You are so different. You are a standout. So people will know who your God is because you resemble me. You're holy. I'm holy. When you act holy, you're showing them me. So when Jesus Christ came on the scene, he was the invisible image of God. So when you saw Jesus, you saw a holy God. Jesus was the holy son of God. He was holy in his walk, in his talk, in his action. Fast forward when you got born again, Jesus came in you. The life of Christ is in me. So therefore, I am to be Christ-like. I'm to be godly to Becky. I'm to be Christ-like to my family. I'm to be a holy man as your pastor. How do you do this, Pastor Jeff? You must sweat and work real hard. It's not rolling up your sleeves. It's surrendering to the authority and the lordship of a holy God ruling and reigning in your life. He saved you to be holy. And God wants his people distinct and different. Back to Leviticus. So when you read Leviticus, it was all these like weird laws. And when you start reading Leviticus, you're like, my Goodness, God was strict. I mean, your diet. You could only eat fish with scales and fins that swam in the ocean in pursuit of their dinner that was alive. But you couldn't be a bottom feeder. You couldn't eat shrimp. You couldn't eat oysters. You couldn't eat clams. I'm sorry. Couldn't eat scallops, crabs. Now, of course, we're not bound to that law today. But they were bottom feeders. Couldn't eat catfish. Oh, man. And so they would feed on the bottom. Couldn't eat them. You, you couldn't eat a vulture. Couldn't eat an osprey. Couldn't eat a hawk. Because they would pounce on things and kill them. You couldn't eat a bird that was all about death. Diet. Holy. Different distinct if you're a lady in bible days and you're cooking dinner for your family and you pull out a dish in the cabinet and it's got a roach in it you just couldn't kill the roach and wash it real good you had to throw the dish away you had to literally break the dish and throw it away god was so big on cleanliness you ever had a sore on your hand or your face you'd have to leave the camp until it got healed then you could come back into the camp and there'd be a special ceremony to receive you. If you ever got a spot on your clothes, you had to literally cut that spot out of your clothes. If the spot spread, you had to take all the clothes away and throw them away. You're like, wow, that was some strict. It was. But it was God's way of saying, my people are distinct, different. When it came to purity, you had to be faithful to your spouse. Let me tell you something that's not in vogue with the world. Sex is not for a man and a woman. Sex is for a husband and a wife. Did you hear me? Now, people look at me and think I'm a nut job. They think I'm crazy. But if you're a believer, you're not having sex with someone you're not married. You hear me today? So boyfriends and girlfriends don't have sex with one another. College students don't do hookups. College students don't get on Tinder. College students live holy. You don't have intimacy with somebody that you're not married to. 
See, God has a distinct difference for his people. We're to have holy lives. We're to have holy families. Now, is this saying that we're to be perfect? No, we can never be perfect. But it's Jesus Christ in us that conforms us to the likeness of the Lord. And we begin to, you, I said this weeks ago when I opened up Peter. What is holiness? Come up close and hear me. Holiness is to love what God loves and hate what God hates. That's holiness. And when we love what the Lord loves and we hate what the Lord hates, we will be walking in Christ-likeness, holiness. I don't think I can ever do this. Well, maybe because you're not born again, converted. Because if you are a child of God, let me show you this. Verse 17, please. And if you call him Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, when Peter used the word father, that's a family word. That's a family term. He used the word children in verse 14. He uses the word father in verse 17. What is holiness? Resembling your father. God said in Leviticus, be holy, I am holy. Be like me, your father. So when we have a family resemblance, when we're born again, when we're saved, when the life of Jesus is within us, we will resemble Christ, Christ Christ-like, godly, holy. When I grew up, my dad was well-known in our neighborhood. My dad was well-known in our community. He was a man that everybody respected. And I remember that we had a big camper. And every uh, fall, we'd take a fall break to the Smokies but it'd take a lot of work to get that camper running again. And one time my dad was fixing that camper and he needed a sophisticated special tool. And he said to me, he said, Jeff, go down to Ray Leonard's house and ask him for such and such. I need it. And I said, Dad, I don't know Mr. Leonard. He said, I don't care if you don't know Mr. Leonard. He knows me. Go. So I'm terrified. I'm walking down to Mr. Leonard's house. He doesn't know who I am. I'm just a goofy kid with a big head, big ears. You know, back in the 70s, wearing those short uh, socks up to my calves with the big stripes on, tank top, had some muscles. But anyway, so I go down there, and Mr. Leonard, he was intimidating. You ever met one of those men that smoke, and they'll smoke the cigarette so small it's burning their flesh? It's just burning his whole face. He's rugged looking. And I said, my dad needs to borrow such and such. And he said, who is Bob or you? That's what he said. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm going to die here. I'm going to die. He's going to take that pipe wrench and hit me in the head. And I said, my daddy. He's like, I don't know your daddy. Furman Crook. Oh, Furman. Yeah. He gave me the tool. And I thought, man, there was power in the word. Furman Crook. He knew my dad. But you know what? As a kid, it got me thinking. I don't want to do anything to hurt my dad's name in the neighborhood. My dad is respected. My dad is admired. Our family has a good name. And and that day, it was like a little sermon being preached to me that I'm going to get that tool on my dad's name. Now, I'll tell you that story to explain this to you. You carry the name of God. You're a child of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. So at work, we're to look like our father. In the neighborhood, we're to look like our father. When we get all fired up about something and want to post on social media to change everybody's mind, because your social media posts, that's what they do. They change everybody's mind. Wrong. All you do is make people mad. Why don't we resemble the father? That's what he's saying. When we have a relationship with the Father, we will be holy like our heavenly Father is holy. We'll walk in fear of God. Notice the reference to fear. People sometimes say, oh, being afraid of God is bad. No, no. Fear of God means reverence. Fear of God means respect. Fear of God is loving him on your knees. Fear of God is realizing he's holy and you want to be that way. Okay, it's been a direct message. Not typical Peter message. I've been doing a lot of praying as I prepared to teach this because, I mean, how often do you hear sermons on holiness and being holy? It's pretty direct. 
And I've been praying that you would listen to the message today with your heart because this is God's call on you as a Christian. If you're not a believer, you probably didn't like what I said. If you're not a believer, you probably don't agree with what I said. But if you're in the family of God, you know I'm talking to God's people because it's coming from the Holy Bible. And he's calling us to be holy. So because it's so heavy, I thought that I'll give a couple practical things to hear to live out holiness this week. Just a real quick list that I want to run by you and then we're gonna have our altar call. So holiness is commanded. Make a note of that. What I'm trying to tell you is this is not an option. Do you wanna be holy or not? God's like, do you want to? Won't hurt my feelings. What you think, pal? Nope. He says, be holy. Holiness is essential. If you're a child of a holy God, you're going to strive to walk in holiness. If you have no interest in being holy, you don't belong to God. First John says, if you say you walk in the light but walk in darkness, you lie and do not practice the truth. So this is real essential for every married couple, for every family to say, we're gonna be holy people of God. Holiness is courageous, write that down. Holiness is courageous, it's not for cowards. It is not lived out on home court. It is not lived out on home court. It's an away game. You ever played on a a team and, man, you know how to hit the three-pointers at the home court, but then you're you're going to a cruddy gym and everything's backwards? That's when it's really the test to know what kind of player you are. I'm going to tell you something. We don't have the home court advantage as holy Christians. We're like the people in Babylon when they said, bow to the image. And Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, man, they, they were bold. They had holy boldness. And if you're, if you're going to be holy, you're going to be alone sometime. If you're going to be holy, you'll stand alone. You're going to create heat when you turn on the light. Holy people are courageous. Holiness demands knowledge. Make a note of that. What do I mean by that? You're not going to be holy if you don't know the Holy Bible. Lots of believers do their own thing because they, know, they don't know what God said for them to do. And you got to get scripture in your spiritual bloodstream. Here's what I've learned about getting in the Bible. When you get into the Bible, the Bible will get into you. Your ideas, your opinions will fade away and you'll get biblical convictions about all types of things in life. And you don't go on what you feel. You don't go on what the majority say. You do what God has said in the holy book. And holiness demands knowledge. The more you know God's word, you'll be conformed to a holy God. Write this down. Holiness holiness demands discipline. The flesh doesn't want to be holy. You'll never wake up and your flesh say, hey, be holy today. It's cool to be holy No, your flesh is going to say, send your face off today because it feels good. The flesh doesn't enjoy holiness. Let me tell you what the flesh enjoys. Gossip. Let me tell you what the flesh enjoys. Greed. Let me tell you what the flesh enjoys. Lust. Let me tell you what the flesh enjoys. Laziness. And so every day we got to discipline our body to say, I'm going to be holy today. Holiness is pervasive. That means it's in all of your behavior. Holiness goes down, down deep into your home, into your marriage, into your bank account, into your responses. Let me tell you something else holiness touches. You ready for this? You're driving. I wish I wouldn't have said that. Man, I was built for speed. Slow drivers annoy me. Get in the slow lane. Matter of fact, get off the road. I'm a man of God on a mission with souls to save. Get out of my way. In the name of Jesus, I'll call. But when you're holy, you won't do mean things with your finger. When you're holy, it changes the way you even respond in traffic because holiness gets into every bit of you as a Christian. And holiness is lovely. Holiness is lovely. It's beautiful. C.S. Lewis said it's a great myth because everybody thinks, oh, I won't be holy. Oh, I won't be holy. 
Because if you're holy, you don't smile, you don't do anything. Oh, I don't want to be holy. Let me tell you something. If you're a married woman out there, you want a holy husband. You don't want an unholy wretch. You want a holy man you can trust. You want a holy man that prays for you. Listen to me, sir. You want a holy woman. You, you want a holy parent. You want your kids to be holy when they go off to college. Why? Because it's lovely. It's marvelous. Because Jesus was holy. And everybody loved to hang around Jesus. Children would flock to Jesus. Religious teachers would come to Jesus. Pickpockets, prostitutes, and thieves came to Jesus. Why? He was compassionate. He was loving. He was tender. He was kind. Holiness is so attractive. You know what I've learned? The lost world really doesn't have a problem of Christ. They have a problem with Christians who are unholy. They're sick of our phoniness. They're sick of it. They're sick of it. We act just like the lost world. We spend our money like them. We think like them. We do everything like them. There's no distinction. And they're like, you phony, why do I need your religious garbage? They don't have a problem with Christ. They have a problem with us when we don't look like Christ. Time for altar call. So today, if you're a believer, you may need to say, God, I'm just going to come pray with my wife today. You're going to say to your husband, honey, let's go pray together. We just want to be a holy couple. We want our marriage to be holy. Maybe there's some students. I'm so proud. Do you know today we baptized a 15-year-old in the 915 service? We baptized three 16-year-olds in the 11 o'clock service. I'm telling you, the smile of God is on Christ's place, how we're loving and reaching the next generation. Let's pray for our young people to be holy. Let's pray that God would have all of us. Think about holiness also with this word beginning with a W, wholeness. We all want wholeness. Shalom, serenity, security, peace. It comes from being holy. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe today you've been listening to the message and you're not a believer and you're like, wow, I really want to know more. I want to be this way, but something's keeping me from doing it. You need a relationship with Jesus. You need to be born again. And the Lord loves you. He sent Jesus to be your Savior. And when you invite Jesus into your life, He makes you holy. Today, if you have never received Jesus as your Savior, I'm here at the front. You can stop in our connection room, and we've got amazing, kind people that will spend time with you and pray with you. If you're a believer today, you can only do one thing with this message. Truly do one thing. Embrace it in the power of the Holy Spirit and live out the truth. And I'm praying that that will happen today. Make us holy people of God, Lord God. This we pray in your name. Amen.